uh, the TV's. TV's not working. Is it behind you? Is it not working through here? Found it? Oh. There is, but the thing is, it's working fine. I mean, my computer definitely picked it up. Is it BMD issue? My no, it's good. My computer definitely picked it up, like change the resolution and everything. Safi had it up the other night, right? Got it. It works on my iPad. Oh, what happened? There we go. Huh? So, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you clear the guys? Seven three four zero. Can you ask the guys? Okay, ready? Huh? How much? Twenty percent or less? We'll make it. Unless you want to uh, take one of these. Huh? Oh, I don't have a cable. Sorry, right. we'll roll with it, inshallah. Okay. All right. Assalamualaikum. Sorry about the delay. There we go. We're all good. It wouldn't be an Islamic center without technical difficulties. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Welcome home, everybody. It's good to have everybody here, alhamdulillah. Uh, if you haven't already seen the carpet, then you know, mashallah, we got carpet. Um, I First things first, I wanted to um, go over a couple of things. Uh, number one is that we do obviously have a thought. We're going to, inshallah, have a thought after uh the Maghrib prayer is done and we're going to serve it like we do normally. I do request that, inshallah, you come in here and eat or go outside, but try to avoid that lobby area because there's just a lot of traffic that's going in and out at that time. And so stopping and eating in that lobby, like posting up in that area is going to make it difficult, inshallah. So if you can, just grab, you know, the food that we have and you can, you know, it's nice outside. It's dry, I think. Uh, you can, you know, pull up a piece of cement or you can come in here and eat, inshallah, and, you know, Try to make sure you don't make a mess uh, as much as possible. Uh, that's number one. Number two is that um, 
we do have some people who brought, mashallah, like donuts and chai and things like that. So that'll be served, you know, closer to post Maghrib time on the food table that they have outside, inshallah. Uh, last but not least, I think there's more than 64 people here, right? Okay, we have we need 64 sustainers to sign up, inshallah, this week <laughs> to meet our goal. So uh, I would like to ask humbly everybody, inshallah, if you can. The amount is irrelevant. We just want to get as many people to have ownership in the community as possible. So whether it's like 10, 20, or whatever, uh, five, whatever you want to give, inshallah, please do go to rootsdfw.org sustain and sign up to become a sustainer. And if you already have, you can increase your amount, inshallah, uh, by logging in, or you can text your friends and family and ask them if they say, what is this? Just say, don't worry about it, okay, <laughs> inshallah. Now you can explain to them, of course, that's fine. Uh, but you know, if we can get 64 people tonight, then we'll reach our goal and alhamdulillah be uh, very successful. Um, we, the root space that's back there, uh, I'm going to put up some pictures. Uh, there's been a lot of significant progress. Obviously, we can't access it, but we've done things like, they did like really, really difficult things that no one's going to notice. Like we, we broke the windows down and made them bigger to have more natural light in because they were smaller. We added another door. All these things cost a lot of money, but you can only do them now before you move in. You can hear them literally working right now. Mashallah. I did not pay them to do that. Uh, but they're hard at work with your donations. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're doing all kinds of stuff from the back there. I think they're actually tiling the bathrooms right now. I think that's why. Usually they, they have a saw when they're cutting tile. So we're going to try, inshallah, to, to get through. Um, tonight is the last hard work of Ramadan. It's, uh, you know, the, the conclusion of our series for this month. Um, you know, we tried our best to make it about relating to Ramadan and connecting to the spirit of Ramadan. We're going to finish off with a chapter from In the Early Hours, which is a book that we've been reading on Saturday nights here. Um, I wasn't here last time because I was traveling. Mufti Kamani, mashallah, came and did an excellent job. I was watching it while I was uh, out of town. And, um, but I wanted to finish with this chapter because ultimately the goal of Ramadan is to gain taqwa. And taqwa, the definition of that you can define it many different ways, but in reality, it's about having a sustained and strong relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of it all, when a person wants to know where they stand with Allah, there's a few things that they can look to, right? So if you have that question in your mind, what's my status with Allah? Am I on good terms with him? Am I struggling, right? You can speculate all you want and you can kind of try to figure it out, give yourself excuses. We all know the drill. But there's a few things that you can look to and that will instantly tell you. Almost like if you want to know what your grade is, there's a few things you can look to that will instantly tell you. And so here, Khurum Murad, the author, he writes about a few things that we can check on. Okay. So I'll read, inshallah, um, and I'll pause. And I want to get through the whole chapter, so I'm going to try to speed a little bit through it. He says, each day in our salah, we repeatedly make one humble request to Allah, our creator and our sustainer. Guide us to the straight way. You guys know... Every other portion of Qur'an is optional. The only portion that is mandatory in the Salah is Surah Al-Fatiha. And I know we talked about that when we did Tafsir Surah Al-Fatiha. There's a reason as to why that is. The Prophet Sallallahu literally said that if a person does not read Fatiha in their prayer, their Salah is not, is not valid. So when something is absolutely obligatory, it means that the essence of whatever you're doing relies upon that. Okay. So the entire exercise of prayer, I mean, if you took away the intention, what is prayer? It's just like a weird Middle Eastern yoga, right? Like it's just bowing and getting up and you know what I mean? But with the intention and with the essence of servitude and submission, prayer goes from just physical action now to something else, okay? And so this line, ihdina sirat mustaqim, is what the scholars say is like the nectar or the essence of the entire prayer. That the entire prayer revolves around this idea that you're quite literally, you're begging Allah multiple times a day, 17 times a day, that, oh Allah, allow us to stay on the straight path. Because the straight path is one that is, number one, it's easy to navigate. Doesn't mean that it's always easy to do, but when the direction is just straight, I was trying to tell my father-in-law, but we were driving, alhamdulillah, we moved closer to the campus. And so my father-in-law came over, we were driving for Sarawih, and uh, we were coming here. And my house to here is like a series of left and right turns. Like literally, I think there's three left and three right turns. It's like a weird zigzag. And so I was trying to explain to him, and you know, like when you have elder parents or elder in-laws, like you try to, you try to simplify things as much as possible. 
you know? So they're like, what's this iPad? You're like, it's like a big iPhone. You know, you're trying to explain things in simple terms. So I'm trying to explain to him how to get here. And I'm like, oh, it's simple. He's like, oh, okay, is it just straight? And because that's what people tend to go back to when they want to know directionally what is simple. He goes, is it just, is it straight? And I said, no, 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 it's not. You have to, you know, you take a left and then you take a right and then you go. And then from there, it's easy. He goes, what comes after that? And I was like, a left and a right. And then another left and a right. Well, light and then a left and then we'll light another right. And then you take a left to get in the parking lot. Okay. And he, he was, even though the distance for me is shorter and even though the drive is very simple, what the complexity of the turns and the, it, it, it's daunting, it's intimidating. So when, when we understand this path of Islam to be straight, what we understand as part and parcel of that is that in its essence, it's not impossible. Okay. Now there might be ups and downs, hills and valleys, but you can always see your destination, can't you? Like when it comes to Islam, you're never, Allah never blinds you from what, from your goal. He never says do this and, you know, wait and find out. No, he says, pray fast, give charity. And then even then he tells you for those people who do this, there's a reward waiting for them. He never says that if you do this, then maybe who knows, right? Because why that in and of itself is a, is a form of, uh, you know, it's a form of, of delusion right upon us. And so he says that this is the essence of the Salah. It is only by seeking and staying on the straight path that we can ever hope to attain true salvation and success. And I was, you know, this is something that, again, you have to sort of reframe how you think about life. What is success? Is success, you know, if somebody came in here right now and I introduced them, said that, you know, Patrick at the door there, mashallah, you guys see Patrick, one of our great volunteers. Sorry, Patrick. If I said Patrick had a degree from Harvard, right, everyone's like, oh, wow, mashallah. You know, people start staring at him. If I said that he works here or he's a surgeon or he's that, these are all other measures of success. Dunya, we measure success. Now, if you went to Harvard or if you're a surgeon, I'm not trying to rag on you. But these are methods of success. These are methods of success that are steeped in the dunya. But if somebody walked in and said like, oh, I just prayed Asr, we, he wouldn't get a standing ovation. Right. No one would like pat him on the back or no one would let her know, like, hey, good job. We'd be like, yeah, right. Congratulations. Right. Only two more to go today. Because we tend to look away from spiritual success and spiritual and we focus really on the material success. But what he says here is that if you truly understand Ramadan, then what Ramadan does for you is it flips that paradigm. Ramadan tells you that you can attain any kind of worldly success you want. But if you don't attain spiritual success, then have you actually succeeded? And the answer, of course, is no. And so, and that's why Allah Ta'ala says on the Day of Judgment, what is the person going to say out loud when they get their book in their left hand? What is he going to say? My wealth did not save me. All that wealth that I saved, like all the investments I made, all the equity I had, everything that I thought about, that I planned about, you know, people spend hours and hours reading about how to increase their wealth. And then when they die, it all becomes pointless. And then that person on the day of judgment is going to say, what? My wealth did not serve me. My wealth did nothing for me. So he says that this is the ultimate idea of success. What then was, must we do to ensure that Allah accepts and grants our prayer? He explains to us, whoever holds on to Allah, then they have already been guided onto a straight way. So if you want to know if Allah is giving you access to that straight path one question is how close am i to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay now he gives us some characteristics what is i'tisam billah what is holding on to allah how do we develop a close attachment and close relationship with allah you guys feel closer to allah in ramadan yeah how many of you feel even a fraction closer to allah in ramadan raise your hand okay that's good and it's it's at the same time ramadan is very important it's no secret why why do you guys think that is? I'm going to hide them. Why do you think you feel closer to Allah? <coughs> Shaitan's locked up. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe that is. But you know, there's interest. Have you guys ever seen how they train circus animals? I'm not a big fan of the circus, by the way, FYI. Have you ever seen how they train the elephants to stay inside the circle, the big top? What they do is, you know, the the... the this is like a famous sort of, I guess, analysis, but in order for the elephant to stay inside, I mean, elephant's a pretty big thing, right? Okay, so if an elephant wants to, we can just bust through that tent and like destroy everything. 
So how do they get the elephant to stay inside the tent? Only walking in a circle. You guys understand? You understand the imagery? I'm uh, okay. You guys know what circus is? All right. <laughs> so, like, I think I follow it on Instagram. So the way that they get that elephant to stay without obviously chaining it, because if you if people come to pay to see the circus and they see that you've just chained an animal, like you're gonna lose a lot of customers. Right? No one wants to bring their kids and then they see that this animal is being abused. No one wants to see that the animal that they're enjoying has been abused. We just want to see that it's been abused and then take away the abuse. May Allah forgive us. So what they do is they, they, they chain one of the legs of the elephant and they stake like an anchor in the center of the tent. And then what happens? The elephant can only walk. The length of the chain is only out to what? The radius of the circle. So the elephant can only walk along the circumference. You guys, I, I paid attention to geometry, by the way. Okay. <laughs> diameter, not radius, not diameter. Okay. So the elephant can only walk along the circumference. And they make this elephant do this for like ever. So that when they remove the chain, the elephant mentally is already submitted to the fact that he has to just keep going in this circle. Okay. Even though they're not chained. Some of the scholars of Tezkiah, they said, not using this example, but they said that this is what shaitan does to us for Ramadan. You guys ever wondered if shaitan's locked up, why we sin? Because shaitan spent 11 months training us, literally coaching, right, whispering into us. And then for Ramadan, the chain is removed from us and he's locked up. And we keep doing the same sins, right? Hopefully we've, you know, dialed it down, but we keep engaging in the same behavior. And they're like, hold on, I thought shaitan was locked up. Well, he is. But you guys were in the, or I was, you know, told the 11 months of boot camp with Shaitan. And so one of the reasons why you get closer to Allah is because you do. It's almost like you have that moment where you wake up and you're like, okay, Shaitan's not here. Say low power. Yeah. MashaAllah, great. All right. So what else? Anyone else? Why are you closer to Allah Ramadan? It's the month of mercy. You can feel it. It's tangible. All right. A friend of mine last night, two nights ago, got pulled over. And he was on his way to pick up Suhoon for some people at IHOP, of course, the Muslim establishment, the Islamic House of Pancakes. <laughs> All right, and Ramadan becomes the Islamic House of Pancakes. So, and he got pulled over by a cop, and the cop was like, I think he was going out really fast, like very, very fast, he said, 60 on the 20. And the cop goes, where are you going? All right, he's like, I should arrest you right now. Where are you going? And my friend says, uh, I'm going to pick up food for some people at the masjid. And the cop, like, he said instantly, like, something take a, like came over him. And he goes, oh, you guys are fasting, right? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, how much time do you have left? And he's like, 45 minutes or something. And he's like, all right, here's a warning. Drive safe. It's not worth, like, pancakes are not worth dying over. <laughs> but he let him go. And wallahi, like, my friend told me this story last night. And I had a, a very similar story from a few years ago. He got pulled over on the way to, you know, to Hajjad. And, you know, Qiyam or whatever at the masjid. And the cop's like, Why, where are you going? Why are you driving this fast? And I'm like, I'm going to prayer at the mosque. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's Ramadan. And he let, he let me go. The mercy is palpable. And I, I wouldn't test it, right? I wouldn't, like, <laughs> intentionally, like, go out there. Right? I wouldn't be like, you know, that's what other fans said. Um, but it's palpable, okay? I mean, look at how generous people are. Look at how generous communities are. You know, we say that we want to serve people of thought you know, on, on Monday night for a heart work, and it's like a three to $4,000 bill to cover if thought for everybody. And people donate it like it's nothing. I mean, we had, we had too many pledges. Does that make sense? We had way too many people offer to pay for a thought for hard work. But then like, if we try to do that rest of the year, everyone was like, no, no, no. Dinner for hard work? No way. Why? Because the mercy is palpable. Okay, what else? You're, doing, you're in line more with what you're made to be doing. Right, we're worshiping Allah more. We're doing our job, right? We're doing our job, and so we feel the benefits of what we're doing. Yeah, you had your hand. That was yours. Okay, we're doing more, mashallah. Yeah. When you're fasting, how are you more conscious of your actions? Okay, you don't want to do anything that would break your fast or contradict your fast. So you're like, definitely don't want to break your fast because there's serious implications there if you purposely break your fast, right? You definitely don't want to do that. But then there's like, man, I'm fasting. Like, I don't want to do this, even though it doesn't necessarily break my fast, but I don't want to be the fasting person that does that, right? I'm not, I don't want to be the fasting person that misses all my prayer and backbites and, you know, does this and this. And this. People, a lot of people like give up movies and music for Ramadan, 
Now, you know, it's not a Ramadan specific thing to give it up, but they're like, you know, I don't want to do this while I'm fasting. You know, it's like the odd night. Tonight's the 25th night of Ramadan, right? Odd night, last 10 nights. If I ask, who wants to go watch a movie? People are like, man, what are you doing, man? Now, it's not haram to watch a movie tonight, but it's very, very, pretty darn close, right? Given the fact that it's a very special opportunity. But again, no one wants to do that. So everyone gains this, this you know, qurb to Allah, this closeness to Allah for so many reasons. Qurb Murad lays out a few of them. Number one is that we become more thankful. How do we become more thankful in Ramadan? You tell me. Okay, by forcing yourself into a state of fasting, whether it's, you know, if a person who can fast or if people who can't for, for medical reasons or whatnot, but to be in the environment of a fasting community, it reminds you to what? To be grateful for what you have. You know, like I said before, earlier in the month, if a person complains about food in this month, there's something deeply wrong. Because after being away from food and drink for how many hours are we fasting? 14? Okay. 14 hours, you haven't drank, you haven't had a single sip or a bite, and all of a sudden now you have an opinion? <laughs> you know what you should, you know what you should give after fasting? Anything. Like if someone's like, Do you want water? You're like, yes. Do you want juice? Yes. Do you want boiling water? You're like, sure. I heard the Japanese do it, right? Like, <laughs> I heard it's good for you or something, right? You just anything that you can get that can break your fast. The, why? Because when you deprive yourself of something in that deprivation, Allah has shown you something, which is what? You have way too much and ask for way too much, right? You and I, we have way too much. We ask for way too much. And part of this is because of the nature of our environment. You know, I, I'll never forget when we go to Turkey every year with Qadam, alhamdulillah, we will join us. And every year after like the third day of donor kebab and like Adana kebab, People are like, can we have cheeseburger kebab? Like they want American food or they want something unique. Why? Because in America, we're so accustomed to choice. We're so accustomed. Like, where do you want to eat? One of the most, one of the most difficult questions people would visit Dallas, where should I eat while I'm here? Everyone has their opinions about where is good or where is not. But honestly, the plethora of choices is too much. And it makes us feel like this is normal. How many of you came from a small Muslim community? where you had to drive to like another bigger one to buy your meat. You guys remember that? See, no. Some of y'all are like, what do you mean? We had to like drive to Irving? No, you have to drive to like a large metropolis. Like we lived in a, in a, in a smaller city in Tennessee and we had to drive to Atlanta to get like food for weddings. But the chef, they were, oh, we flew in our chef. Oh, from Pakistan? No, from Atlanta. <laughs> Literally, this is a conversation because why? Because the smaller city didn't have access. I mean, if you got meat there, I remember when Crescent started selling chicken in Walmart, we like had a day off of school. All the Muslims were like outside of Walmart, like, like begging Allah for his like barakah and blessing. Like, and we got that. It was a big deal, right? When you're put in situations where scarcity is the norm, okay, fasting, you are in a scarce state. So none of you, alhamdulillah, have asked what's her iftar tonight. I'm so proud of you because we should be grateful for everything. So gratitude instantly right a lot of people ramadan is a chance to reconnect with family and friends yes or no yeah there's the iftar party and then for the courageous amongst you there's a suhoor party right those who work from home there's a suhoor party and then there's everything in between and because again you've been doing this all day long and you know that there's other people in your community as well you get together and you start to reconnect right friendships you make new friendships you reconnect with old friendships or family and you're grateful for that, right? You're grateful for that. You give up time maybe that you used to spend doing different things and you're grateful for the people in your life. So he says, the first characteristic of being grateful and thankful to Allah for everything you possess, including your wealth, health, status, intellectual abilities, and life. You should recognize that your very existence and your continuing sustenance are dependent upon Allah. There is no guarantee about the next bite you'll take or the next breath you'll take. There's no guarantee. And I know that we say this to the degree that it's almost like sometimes a little bit on the cliche side, that you have to really realize that your life could end at any moment. But it only takes one example in your personal circle for you to appreciate what that means. 
And this is a lived reality. If people can be grateful to Allah all the time, they will never be far away from him. Gratitude is the way in which shaitan said he's going to try to take us away from Allah. Shaitan's plan and plot to take Muslims and believers away from God was what? Shaitan's whole strategy was I'm going to absolutely, I'm just going to just take over the heart of, the, of your believers, of your servants, and I'm going to surround them, and I'm going to make them ungrateful to you. I'm going to make them people that never thank you. What happens when you don't thank somebody? For the blessings that they consistently give you, the relationship ends. There are people that have been part of families, friendships, whatever, for years, and only a certain amount of their heart can take it when they're not recognized for their appreciation and their value. Right? Husbands and wives, parents. I mean, there will be parents that will come to me and say, like, my child has never once even thanked me for anything. And you know, they say parents' love is unconditional. It's true. But every human has their limit. And I've seen parents come to me and say, and think about this with your own parents for a second, that my child has never thanked me. And I used to just be able to just keep going. But now, like, I can't do it anymore. I feel so taken for granted that I just cannot fake this, that I can't hide this pain, I can't fake it, right? So every relationship has its limit. And even with Allah, if a person consistently, constantly receives blessings from Allah all the time, and they don't once turn to Allah to thank Him, that relationship is as weak as their ability to recognize their blessings. So number one, he says, is being grateful to Allah. Whatever praise is due, therefore, it is due to Him alone. Nobody has the power or the resource to give you anything except by his will. His bounties and blessings are countless. There was a scholar I was reading uh, the other day from this book. It's just statements of scholars, just statements of people. And one of them was advising one of his friends. And he said, raise your prayers to the one who can answer you, not to those people that will turn their back on you. When you pray, raise your prayer to the one that his door is always open not to the one that will leave you on red, right? And what he meant by that was human beings will always disappoint at some level, either not getting back to you on time or not getting back to you at all or not. Re- because why? Because everybody is weak. We all have our limitations. No one is omnipotent except for Allah. So it's a waste of time to prioritize asking people and begging people and seeking from people when a person first has not sought from Allah. If we understand that Allah is the provider and people are the means, then we're in a good spot. But if we only turn to Allah after every other door has been closed, then there's a serious deficiency in our understanding. So he says, is then he who creates comparable to any that cannot create, will you not then take heed? For should you try to count Allah's blessings? It's actually, by the way, should not be blessings, it should be blessings, singular. You can never compute them. A little translation error there. If you try to count one of Allah's blessing in your life, you cannot count it. How hard is it to count to one, everybody? Can you guys count to one? Everyone say one. It's like a Tawheed class. Say one. You know what's crazy? Allah says when it comes to your blessings, you can't even count to one. You can't even finish that number. Because the more you look into the blessing the more you're unable to complete how appreciative you are, right? You start thinking about your eyesight. I always hated in college when they used to do these like uh, icebreaker questions. Which one would you rather not have, your eyes or your ears? I'm like, man, why are you asking this? You know, because then you start to think of the implications of that. Would you never see your mother or hear her voice? Would you never rather like witness a sunrise or like hear the birds chirping in the morning? Like, what would you rather never? You know, subhanAllah. And the more you d- dive deep into that, you're like, geez, I never realized how much I appreciated having these blessings. And the older you get, you understand. The older you get, you understand, subhanAllah. When Allah takes away certain abilities from you. That's why in the Quran, Allah highlights the lifespan. He says that we created you weak, and then you became strong, and then you become weak again. And on, it's on that second path not the first one, it's on the downhill, that your gratitude just starts pouring out because you realize, man, I used to be able to 
jump and run and I was strong and I could stay up late and I could do this and I could do that. And now if I so much as look at a glass of warm milk, I'm tired, right? Forget drinking it. You know, I can't even jump over a piece of paper that's flat. You know what I mean? Like all my ability is taken away from me. I'll never forget, man, subhanAllah. My mother, man, my mom, Egyptian women are something else. I grew up, the memories of my mom, do you guys remember how TVs used to be back in the day? Not like this. You remember the big tube TVs? Or it was like a, it was like a triangle on its side? Okay, so the flat end and then, remember how those things were like 6,000 pounds? Like in order to buy one, they had to bring a crane from Best Buy to your house and like lift it into your living room. It was so heavy. So I remember like we used to be like legitimately, you know, my mom had very, very, some might say draconian, but it worked. She had ways of regulating our video game time. All right. So we used to have, you know, PlayStation, whatever, PlayStation 2. Never, my parents couldn't afford buying it for us. My uncle, we had a rich uncle. All right. Uncle John. I'm not making that name up. I mean, draw Allah, it gives him, gives him Islam, mashallah. He's a wonderful guy, mashallah. So Uncle John used to show up with his Mercedes Benz and he'd be like, hey, and I'm like, hey, like, go, go over my trunk, get my bag. I open the trunk and there's like a PS through two or whatever it was. And, like, oh. and that was his way of surprising us. He's like, gotcha. All right. And so and my mom is like, why does your uncle keep doing this? This shit? I'll keep bringing these games in our house. It was a very interesting moment. So I, I remember my mom, like, you know, she, she, she used to work sometimes on weekends. Uh, she's a nutritionist at a hospital. So she used to go in early and she knew that if she went in and she left everything, we would just play video games all day. So, you know, she used to first take the controllers and then my brother bought replacement controllers. <laughs> And he hid them and we would just use them. And then she took the power cable and then he just went and bought a new power cable. <laughs> so he would like, you know, and then eventually she took away games and then we would just kind of like, you know, get other games. So then eventually we come downstairs one day and I'm not joking. I don't know why she didn't take the system. She took the TV. <laughs> she took the entire TV in her minivan. Okay. And, and again, like my brother was asleep. I was asleep. Don't ask me how she did it. Right? Like, you know, they talk about those like crazy stories, adrenaline rushes, lifting, lifting cars <laughs> off of babies. Uh, maybe this is her adrenaline rush. Okay. So I grew up with the idea that my mother, like she's super strong, you know, I mean, she, you know, strong and able to take pain. I mean, very, her threshold is very high. Anyone else have a mom that has uh, tongs for hands that they can just turn things in the oven? My mom literally would be like bread on the, you know, not, no, we didn't, we didn't toast like any chubs or like aishami or whatever, like aish, we, we used to toast on the stove, on the fire. So she would just do that with her hand. Uh, and then I'll never forget, man, subhanAllah, just, you know, a few years back uh, when she asked me to help bring a gallon of milk inside because it hurts her fingers. So I grew up with my mother being like this, you know, and my father, of course, very strong as well, but I'm just, I'm telling you about my mom because she's like 4'11". So she was so strong. And then like a decade later, she can't carry a gallon of milk. Right. It's just the reality of life. man. <laughs> like you start here, you go up. And then while you're here, you have all these standards that you develop. And then on your way down, you realize like, man, this body is given in on me. And you realize like, this isn't me anymore. <clears throat> you know, you're not your body. You're a soul. Your soul is just in the body for a short while. And so when you start to have those limitations, when they start to become apparent, when your health starts to have, because everyone, everyone's health, you're, everyone's eventually going to pass away. So if you see your life as not living, but I'm kind of slowly dying, then you start to realize the nature of your body. And you start to understand that, you know what, the best thing I can do is be grateful for whatever I have right now. Instead of looking forward and trying to obtain more, accumulate more, I just need to be grateful to Allah at every moment. And so he says that you can never even count one blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is all forgiving, all compassionate. Allah knows all you keep secret as well as that which you bring to the open. So it's for this reason that Allah commanded Prophet Ibrahim Aysam to say, it is he who created me and so it is he who guides me. It is he who gives me to eat and drink. And whenever I am sick, it is he who heals me. And it is he who makes me die and then will bring me back to life. And upon him, I time I hope that he would forgive my sins on the day of judgment. And this is a beautiful thing to start your day with. This is a beautiful verse to think about, to reflect about, that everything goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, in the Quran, Allah compares the term shukr and kufr. Shukr means gratitude. Kufr means what? What does it mean? If someone's 
if someone commits kufr or like someone is a kafir, it means that they're what? A disbeliever, a rejecter, right? Okay. So if someone's a rejecter, how is it the opposite of gratitude? Well, a little bit of beauty in the Quran. That's a lot, but here's a little bit. Allah says that if you are grateful, that is equivalent to iman. It's like a synonym. But if you are ungrateful, it's actually equivalent to kufr. How does a person become a disbeliever in Allah? Very simple. They're not grateful to Allah. If you're grateful to Allah, you can't deny him. You can't. Right? It's like going out there and getting food and then being like, yeah, no one brought this for me. I made it myself. Like your denial of the blessing is tied deeply to your inability to express appreciation for the, for the one who blesses. If a person can appreciate the one who bestows blessings, then they will see every blessing they have as a communication from Allah. Like everything. Catching a green light, not being late, making a flight that you're running late for, getting a raise, whatever. Any accomplishment, any blessing that you experience, if you see that as being given to you, not being earned, but it's being given to you, then all of a sudden that relationship with Allah starts to climb. Think of all the things you've accomplished. Think of all the things that you have done in your life. Think of the things that you admire about yourself, right? Now realize that all of that at its core, at its essence, if you tie it all the way back to something was given to you by either a capacity or a talent or a characteristic or an opportunity that only Allah could provide. And at the core of it, none of us did anything to earn it. We didn't. Allah gave us opportunities and resources, and maybe he gave us the tawfiq and the good sense to take advantage of the silver tray, the silver platter that he laid out for us. And that's it. And that's it. So that's the essence of shukr. That's number one. Okay. Number two, oh, I skipped over number two, is worshiping Allah. So after gratitude, what do you do? Naturally, when you're grateful to somebody, what do you want? What do you want to do for them? If somebody does you a nice favor, what do you want to do? Huh? Praise them. What do you want to do? Someone said over here, reciprocate it, right? You want to return the favor. Somebody does something nice for you, what do you do? You send them lunch, right? You buy them, you, you bake some brownies for them. You Whatever. You do something nice for them, right? Because everyone has a means of communicating appreciation. And everyone has certain ways that they like to be appreciated. So how do you like to be appreciated? If someone knows you, they'll pick the right way. Okay? The love languages. So someone does something for you, you think about how can I repay them? How can I get them something nice? Anyone here have someone in your life that's impossible to buy a gift for? It's like so difficult, right? You're just like, gosh. Because you really want to show your appreciation, but like you're like stuck. Allah also has a love language, and that is salah. Prayer and worship is the way in which Allah prefers to be thanked. We could do all kinds of things for Allah. Everything. There's so many good things to do. But there is a priority. There is a sequence. Right? Like if I am so grateful to Allah for everything he's given me, and then I go out there and I clean the streets. I go and I remove harmful things from the road, branches, garbage. Is that a good deed? Yes or no? All right, let's go do it. Forget Maghrib. Let's go. You guys want to do that? Should we just skip Maghrib and go do that? No. Why would you say no? Because you understand innately that we do have a sequence. We have a prioritization. We don't skip prayer, which is the greatest act, to do something that is lesser than that, even if that's good. Now, what shaitan will do, and this is a trip. You ready for this? I know we got a few minutes left for a thought, but listen to this. Shaitan, when he sees that you've made like a lot of progress, and he's not able to convince you or to like kind of like bump you to do something that's just outright wrong. His specialty becomes making you choose the lesser of two good options. The lesser of two. He will become a master of negotiating, never doing the best thing, always doing the second or the third best thing, always. And this is how he keeps us away from attaining like this top spot with Allah. And so you'll be sitting there and you pray and then you have to do some sunnah. You have time. It takes 30 seconds, one minute, right? But then you're like, you know what? Let me, let me check my Instagram real quick. You pull out your phone and you scroll and you're like, you know what? 
My friend looks really good, mashallah. Fire emoji, here we go, right? <laughs> you drop a little fire emoji and you're like, it's good, it's brotherhood, it's sisterhood. We should be encouraging. <laughs> Give good news to those who believe. No, man. We can try to wrap our head around it any way we want. Shaitan becomes a specialist at letting us do less instead of letting us do more. Now, Ramadan is pretty amazing because why? We consistently do more than we expect of ourselves. You're in good company. You're with good people. And those people say, you know what, let's go pray. Just, uh, well, I'm not going to, okay, I got I to gotta be honest with you guys. When I was traveling, I was in Canada. I was doing a trip and I was praying Tarawih. And my hotel was an hour away from the masjid that I was at. I was really tired. I had a flight at 6 a.m. the next day. So I prayed four rakat. And I said, okay, it's an hour. I got to dip. I'll finish the other four in my hotel, right? Because Tarawih, you can pray by yourself as well. It's better to pray in congregation, usually, but you can. So I said, I'll just finish it off by myself. So I get up after the four, and the imam next to me, he goes, where are you going? <laughs> and I said, yeah, imam, I said, please, you know, samehni, like, forgive me. Like, I, I'm really tired. I have to go back. I have a flight at six tomorrow morning. And, you know, this is this. And he goes, da, 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 pray two more. I said, okay. And, and mashallah, like, the masjid was beautiful. It was an awesome experience. And the imam was, his recitation was beautiful. Okay, I'll do two more. So then two more finish, and I slowly start to get up, and I just feel his hand. <laughs> and he goes, two more. <laughs> and, he, and, then, and then after the eight, he goes, now you can go. Right? That's the kind of experience you only have in Ramadan. And in Ramadan, when somebody does that, you just can't help but smile and laugh out of love. Like outside of Ramadan, you're like, don't touch me. Right? <laughs> But inside of Ramadan, there's something about your heart that Allah just allows you to love the fact that people are motivating you to give. You know, a friend will text you, say like, hey, I'm donating, like jump in with me, give a hundred bucks. Normally, you'd be like, you send back the SpongeBob text, like, oh, give a hundred bucks, you know? <laughs> but now you're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'll match you. Let me text some other people and see if I can get them to join in too. That, that, that emphasis on worship is, is heightened. Everyone wants to worship more and more. So worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the second way that you can retain that relationship with Allah. Okay? Why? Because it is the language of submission. Worship is the language of submission. When you want to submit to Allah, just ask yourself, how is my worship? Am I doing it? Number one. That's number one. Am I doing it? If I'm doing it, then layer two is, how good is it? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that not every prayer gets a 10 out of 10. It's not pass-fail. Some prayers, the Prophet ﷺ said, they're performed, but they're only rewarded 10% of the prayer. And then he said some are given 20 and 30 and 40 and 50, and then some all the way up to 10 out of 10, mashallah, right? Or 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10. That hadith is very uncomfortable, isn't it? Because you think about all the prayers done, you're like, man, if I just gave a little bit more effort, focus, concentration, I would have gone from a 2 to a 10, Right? And so thinking about your salah, if you're going to stand there and pray, then you might as well give it your all. Okay? And if you, if you compare the times that you rush through prayer and the times that you don't, the difference is like 30 seconds. If you just add a few seconds to every portion, you want to know, Imam Ghazali says this. He says, you want your prayer to be better? Here's a tip. Slow down. Just slow down. If you enjoy and savor each motion in the salah, Instantly, no language, no language acquisition happened, nothing. Your salah will feel a lot more peaceful, a lot more tranquil, a lot more fruitful than the one who speeds through it. And then the third thing that he mentions is the love of Allah. So number one is gratitude, number two is worship, and then the highest station, which is that you reach the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean to love Allah? He said, perhaps it cannot be defined in terms which adequately reflect its nature and importance in a person's life. It is not possible to define it by a formula in a manner we define scientific fact. Imam Ghazali says this, it's so beautiful. Imam Ghazali says that mathematics is a science of, of precision, right? When you measure things in math, you, you don't want to get, if you guys ever answered a question on a math test, you're like about this much and they're like, you fail, right? Because mathematics is a science of precision. Language is a science of communication. Right? Iman and faith, Islam, 
is neither of these things. It's a science of getting to know Allah. And so loving Allah is not like loving other people. Loving Allah is not like loving your friends or family. Loving Allah has moments where it's like it, but it is the ultimate kind of love. It is absolute, which means what? It captivates you, it grips you, it moves you, and you are prepared to do anything for the sake of it. Nothing, nothing is worth fasting 15 hours a day. I mean, if you give up food and drink for Allah, and the average American opens their fridge 16 times a day, I looked it up. 16 times a day, we open our fridges. And all of a sudden, bam, out of nowhere, and I mean nowhere because of the moon sighting issue, we get told that it's Ramadan, and we have to fast for 30 days. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what kind of love you have to have to do that? Even if it's not easy. See, love doesn't make things easy. Love makes doing hard things worth it. Right? Like some people are like, oh, I don't know if I love Allah because it's still hard for me to wake up and pray. No, no, no. That's actually a sign that you do love Allah because if you didn't love Allah, you wouldn't get up and pray. No matter how difficult or easy it was. So to stay and battle yourself and to fight your nafs and to do the right thing despite everything else that's telling you not to, that is the peak of love. And that's what Ramadan gives us just a little taste. And this is why when Ramadan ends, people cry. I cry, of course, but I say, of course, I cry all the time, but people literally cry because they don't want to leave the environment that gave us a taste of what it means to love Allah. They don't want to leave that. Come here next month on a Tuesday night and stand in the lobby, just you and nobody else, right? And see the absence of this beautiful month and what it takes with it. This is why when people celebrate the incoming of Ramadan as a guest, these last 10 nights, they make the most of it. Are we, are we, uh, is there a light show? There's a, <laughs> this is why, that's okay. This is why, no, no, it's okay. We need to go for it. Let's, this is actually a good setting. We should have done this from the beginning. This is why in these last 10 nights, there has to be a concerted effort. If you haven't been able to taste the love of Allah till now, you're not too late. If you haven't been able to be grateful to Allah till now, you're not too late. If you if worship has felt flavorless, unseasoned, there's nothing about it that you enjoy, it's not too late. Ibn Taymiyyah says something really powerful that I'll share with you. He said, لَيْسَ الْعِبْرَةَ بِنَقْسِ الْبِدَايَةِ he said the lesson is not is not deterred or is not defined. The lesson of this month is not defined by the deficiencies of your beginning. The lesson of this month is found in completing the end with, with perfection. What does that mean? It means that we're standing here, we're sitting here now on the 25th night, and for sure we all have deficiencies. We're all disappointed. There were certain nights that we just, it was almost like Ramadan didn't exist that day. If you can move on, Allah can move on from that. If you can forget about it and have an amazing rest of the month, Allah Ta'ala will see that. And that's all that matters. These last few nights, dig deep. And it's especially difficult because they're weekday nights and people are working and whatnot. But dig deep. Do not, I said this at the beginning of the month, do not let a single night of these last 10 by except that you go through your du'as and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you everything that you need and everything that you want and more. We ask Allah ta'ala to accept from us our Ramadan. We ask Allah ta'ala to give us our gratitude of him. We ask Allah ta'ala to make us those who worship him with sincerity. We ask Allah ta'ala to allow us to be those who love him for his sake. We ask Allah ta'ala to purify all of our hearts in this month. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us barakah on this month in our life, in our health, in our wealth, in our relationships. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to have the courage to stand up for what is right and to do what is right according to the path that he has given us, the Quran and his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sunnah 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to capture some of these moments of Ramadan and to bottle them so that we can experience them year round. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to make those changes that we know that we've been needing to make. And we ask Allah ta'ala to allow us to have the tawfiq to be able to transform from who we were to who we know that we can be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be people that emulate his prophet in character and in practice. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of our shortcomings and to grant us all of the blessings of this month, that which we are aware of and that which is hidden from us. Ameen, ameen, ya rabbil alameen. Subhanakallahu bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta nasakir wa tubi ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa So after the adhan, of course, you guys all have your dates, inshallah, you can break your fast if you want. Uh, after the adhan, of course, they're going to pray Maghrib. I would head over there quickly because they, they typically pray right away. Uh, and then we'll come back. We have um, we have chicken shawarma. We have uh, pizza. We got chips. We got all kinds of food, inshallah. So we will enjoy your thought. Assalamu alaikum.